We need vaccines to get back to a normal life and to overcome this global health crisis. Trust has always been an essential component in healthcare, and it's hard to imagine a successful outcome of the global COVID-19 vaccination effort without it. Getting the vaccines where they need to go, I think, is the most important aspect in that they are life-saving. The information management before and after administering the vaccine is important. In that continuum of, of moving toward this global standard, not everyone is going to implement at the same pace. There are things that we can do short of full track and trace that will bring benefit and help us protect the COVID vaccine. Let us build safe systems for now and the future. So we not only have the right vaccine, but the right vaccination to protect the people and eliminate problems. Throughout 2020, we experienced very significant supply chain challenges. Unfortunately, it's a catastrophe or a pandemic in this case, which drives change. I think it's very important not to forget that it's a combination of technology and standards which deliver safer, more efficient care. There has been world-leading contact tracing. 522,000 unique locations have been created by New Zealand businesses. Contact tracing is still critical to New Zealand, and now vaccines are starting to roll out and these global location numbers are being used to help track where the vaccines are being used. Each vaccine cell is that uniquely is tracked by the vaccine tracking system. It is necessary to create feasible and traceable vaccine traceability system in a simple manner. If you move to a standardised label that's electronic, it's easier for staff because they can read the information in the vial because they can see the expiry, they, they have more confidence in what they're getting. If we cannot deliver the right vaccine to people correctly, we will not be able to reduce the effects of the pandemic. The real win here is improving patient safety and there's great time savings and the, the real cherry on the cake then is the data to inform clinical decisions. It might require a little bit of thinking and time and a little bit of cost at the start. The rewards are, are huge. The key thing is how do we educate and work with the business to say there's something more. It's not just vaccinations. It's not just COVID. It's not just COVID poster locations. What's next? We need vaccines to get back to a normal life and to overcome this global health crisis. Trust has always been an essential component in healthcare, and it's hard to imagine a successful outcome of the global COVID-19 vaccination effort without it. Getting the vaccines where they need to go, I think is the most important aspect in that they are life-saving. The information management before and after administering the vaccine is important. In that continuum of, of moving toward this global standard, not everyone is going to implement at the same pace. There are things that we can do short of full track and trace that will bring benefit and help us protect the COVID vaccine. Let us build safe systems for now and the future. So we not only have the right vaccine, but the right vaccination to protect the people and eliminate problems. Throughout 2020, we experienced very significant supply chain challenges. 
Unfortunately, it's a catastrophe or a pandemic in this case, which drives change. I think it's very important not to forget that it's a combination of technology and standards which deliver safer, more efficient care. There has been world-leading contact tracing. 522,000 unique locations have been created by New Zealand businesses. Contact tracing is still critical to New Zealand, and now vaccines are starting to roll out and these global location numbers are being used to help track where the vaccines are being used. Each vaccine cell is uniquely is tracked by the vaccine tracking system. It is necessary to create feasible and traceable vaccine traceability system in a simple manner. If you move to a standardised label that's electronic, it's easy for staff because they can read the information in the vial because they can see the expiry, they, they have more confidence in what they're getting. If we cannot deliver the right vaccine to people correctly, we will not be able to reduce the effects of the pandemic. The real win here is improving patient safety and there's great time savings and the, the real cherry on the cake then is the data to inform clinical decisions. It might require a little bit of thinking and time and a little bit of cost at the start. The rewards are, are huge. The key thing is how do we educate and work with the business to say there's something more. It's not just vaccinations. It's not just COVID. It's not just COVID poster locations. What's next? We need vaccines to get back to a normal life and to overcome this global health crisis. Trust has always been an essential component in healthcare, and it's hard to imagine a successful outcome of the global COVID-19 vaccination effort without it. Getting the vaccines where they need to go, I think is the most important aspect in that they are life-saving. The information management before and after administering the vaccine is important. In that continuum of, of moving toward this global standard, not everyone is going to implement at the same pace. There are things that we can do short of full track and trace that will bring benefit and help us protect the COVID vaccine. Let us build safe systems for now and the future. So we not only have the right vaccine, but the right vaccination to protect the people and eliminate problems. Throughout 2020, we experienced very significant supply chain challenges. Unfortunately, it's a catastrophe or a pandemic in this case, which drives change. I think it's very important not to forget that it's a combination of technology and standards which deliver safer, more efficient care. There has been world-leading contact tracing. 522,000 unique locations have been created by New Zealand businesses. Contact tracing is still critical to New Zealand, and now vaccines are starting to roll out and these global location numbers are being used to help track where the vaccines are being used. Each vaccine cell is uniquely is tracked by the vaccine tracking system. It is necessary to create feasible and traceable vaccine traceability system in a simple manner. If you move to a standardised label that's electronic, it's easy for staff because they can read the information in the vial, because they can see the expiry, they, they have more confidence in what they're getting. If we cannot deliver the right vaccine to people correctly, we will not be able to reduce the effects of the pandemic. The real win here is improving patient safety and there's great time savings. And the, the real cherry on the cake then is the data to inform clinical decisions. It might require a little bit of thinking and time and a little bit of cost at the start. The rewards are, are huge. The key thing is how do we educate and work with the business to say there's something more. It's not just vaccinations. It's not just COVID. It's not just COVID poster locations. What's next? Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, 
to this dialogue about securing trust in the COVID-19 supply chain. With this executive dialogue, GS1, in collaboration with Deloitte, is inviting experts to share facts and inspire confidence. With the first edition, the WHO, the World Bank and healthcare providers have presented the unprecedented collaboration to protect people today and in the future worldwide. The second edition focused on real examples of the vaccine's rollout in Ireland, Turkey and New Zealand. And today, you will hear about the effort to ensure safe vaccines supply chain. Before handing over to Hanno, our moderator today, it's my duty to remind you about the GS1 low caution. You're including during the Q&A, you are not allowed to discuss about price, market share and consumer allocation. And now, Hanno, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and um, thank you everyone for joining. It gives us great pleasure to, uh, to have the session with you all today to talk about trust in the um, COVID supply chain. Um, and the trust is, is clearly critical to getting the um, vaccines to the patients and into the patient's arm. Uh, and why, why is that? Well, firstly, for patients, it's really important to know that they're getting the vaccine that they said they're going to get, that there are no fakes, that there are no issues with it, but also all through the supply chain, that it is absolutely clear that it is uh, uh, safely delivered, that there have been no temperature breaches, but also on the other end, that actually it finds itself as a recognised piece of evidence in the patient's hands. That's particularly becoming important um, in the Western countries. Um, and we know that trust is not built overnight. It takes time. Um, it is trust, building trust in this global vaccine supply chain is not something that you can switch on. It has to be built through actions every day. Um, and we also know that, you know, unless everybody is vaccinated, nobody really gets the collective benefit from it. Um, and this trust in our experience is fundamentally built through uh, capabilities and the reliability of demonstrating those capabilities. And that is at the core of the standards um, that GS1 represents um, and that we as an industry are trying to really propagate to deliver the vaccines at the right time. But there also has to be a degree of humanity and leadership and individual leadership, as well as, fourthly, a sense of transparency in communicating the benefits um, uh, of, of what we're doing in delivering um, vaccines to patients. Um, and we see a lot of that evidence, even in Africa uh, today, where a lot of people uh, where countries like Malawi and South Sudan and Congo are being forced to literally destroy tens of thousands of vaccines because they were not really aware of the expiry date, partly because of the, uh, they couldn't get it to patients quick enough. But the fact that these are uh, are being sort of almost publicly destroyed is actually an act of transparency that will help us um, increase the visibility and the trust um, in that we're doing the right thing. So what are we talking about today? Well, today we're joined by uh, Ken Leggins and Grant Courtney from UNICEF to share their experience about um, bringing vaccines uh, to market and by Peter O'Halloran from um, ACT Health um, to demonstrate um, how that works in Australia. And so I think we should just simply get into it and see how we can build trust um, in vaccines and get people vaccinated. And let me um, start by handing over to Ken Leggins from UNICEF. So thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank GS1 and the organizers of the, um, uh, the dialogue today for inviting UNICEF. Um, we are quite passionate about this issue and hope that we are able to provide information to you today that you will find interesting and hopefully um, motivate you to be engaged. Um, the scope of the problem of substandard and falsified medicines and diverted product is a driver for why we are here today to talk about um, the propensity for falsification of COVID vaccines. So the next slide, Grant, would be helpful. So the 
scope of the problem and then just keep going and that people can read about us, read about us later. Um, and to that extent, I guess having I a little bit about myself, it's Ken Leggins. I'm the chief of the supply chain strengthening center in UNICEF's global supply headquarters in Copenhagen, Denmark. Um, I represented UNICEF on the WHO World Food Program coordinated global COVID supply chain um, and continue to participate with our global partners in addressing the issue of the traceability of the vaccines and national systems, and in particular for the purpose of identifying uh, falsified substandard and diverted products. So. Thank you for that. And then we go on to the next slide. As I was talking about the scope of the problem, um, the World Health Organization um, has, I, through its research, identified that about 30 billion US dollars a year is spent on falsified and substandard vaccines. And this is part of a $200 billion industry globally. Um, if you're reading the news, you probably would have noticed, and I have highlighted some of the issues here in China, they detected fake vaccines within their own borders. You probably read in South Africa, they actually found vials that were not labeled, full of saline, ready for use by counterfeiters. Um, and also in Mexico, they were charging in the realm of US $200 for shots with product which was later found to be falsified. Um, and this is not a low middle income country issue. I think uh, many of the high income country issues have had the same issue. I think the World Health Organization working with the infectious disease data um, observatory um, found out that in the month of March or from the 12th to the 31st, there were 94 reports from 32 different countries of substandard and falsified products. Um, and these included, um, but were not exclusive to the Pfizer vaccine, AstraZeneca, Sinovac, and others. Um, the World Health Organization has issued a regulatory update um, to all regulators indicating that this issue should be considered um, and that they should be aware of suspicious offers, a lot of these being on the internet. So the next slide, Grant. Um, <clears throat> given the context, um, really the time to act is now. Um, one, we know that um, we know that the current threat of the vaccine um, being falsified is real, and I just gave you some of that data. Um, two, we know that substandard and falsified vaccines can impact vaccine hesitancy which gives, as many of you know, probably hearing in the news, um, uh, anti-vaxxers the propaganda to perpetuate fears, of uh, unfounded fears around the effectiveness of the vaccines. And this is another reason to, to work to address this issue. Um, thirdly, um, the need for track and trace capability goes beyond COVID. 19 products and the establishment of a global trust repository, which Grant will speak to in a minute, um, it helps us to create standards, particularly GS1 standards for vaccines, which historically, um, vac UNICEF being the largest procurer of vaccine volume in the world, vaccinating approximately 45% of the world's children, we have not actually had uh, serialized or GS1 labeled products except out of India, as many of you know, the regulations there require that. Um, and so we, the opportunity to use COVID to help standardize this is an opportunity for us to act now. And then finally, the global development uh, is, is really positioned right now to make some significant investments. Gavi, the US government, the Global Fund, others are beginning to really uh, drive efforts for traceability and the COVID vaccine and addressing safety around this is helping to leverage those resources and really drive investments from governments, bilaterals and others. And this we have not seen um, in any recent time. So the next slide, Grant. So what are the three um, the three objectives of our of our work. Um, the first is that we are looking to create a um, a minimal viable solution 
which um, we can um, uh, make available in the very short term because the urgency is now. And we'll hear about that in a second. Um, secondly, we're going to establish a global trust repository, which I just mentioned, that would host traceability data for vaccine manufacturers and can be accessed by the minimal viable solution that will be available in countries. And then, as I also indicated, the global interest in the donor community and in governments, this is helping us to accelerate adoption of GS1-enabled traceability in low- and middle-income countries um, with the tra Traceability Initiative partners. The next slide, Grant. Um, this is not new work, um, and perhaps many of the people listening today would know that, that Traceability has been an issue before COVID. It is a very big issue during COVID and it will remain one after COVID, um, or at least when COVID becomes endemic and manageable. So the partners consist of, as I said, governments. Um, it also consists of UN agencies and financing institutions like the bank, the Global Fund and Gavi, which is the Global Alliance for Vaccines. And most importantly, it involves governments um, who have been involved in working on signing up to GS1, which our colleagues know a lot about. The private sector is engaged, particularly UNICEF through the COVAX facility has been working with manufacturers on such things as serialization. Um, and this work, um, we are building on this work. So the next slide, Brand. And then while building on this work, we have created a governance structure around this one initiative, which is to identify substandard and falsified products. Gavi, UNICEF, USAID of the US government, the bank, the Gates Foundation, and the Global Fund, formerly known as the Global Fund for AIDS, TB, and Malaria, based in Geneva, are all contributing to this work. And I think the presence of the Global Fund, for example, and USAID who are not procuring vaccines themselves, but their interest in this project is indicative of their belief that the Global Trust Repository, our efforts to standardize will have implications not only for the vaccines, but for all donor subsidized products going into low and middle income countries. Um, it's a very simple governance structure. I think anyone involved in project management would recognize some of these structures. We have a steering committee. We've got a management unit, which will be an NGO uh, out of Seattle. Um, and we have task teams that are specifically working on the technical solution or the global trust repository, uh, country deployment, and addressing a lot of the issues around data and policy and usage. Um, and this work is ongoing um, as we speak. And in particular, now we're gonna be talking a little bit about the technical solution in one of those working groups. And I'm gonna hand off to my colleague, Grant, who will take over from now. So thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Ken. Uh, just a very quick introduction to myself. My name is Grant Courtney. I'm an independent consultant uh, and subject matter expertise uh, being supplied to UNICEF and partners. Um, so that's myself. What I wanted to do just before diving into what exactly is this thing that we've teased you about called the Global Trust Repository, um, is just talk about the model that we're looking to implement. And as many of you will be aware, uh, traceability systems have been put in place in many parts of the world, uh, including uh, Europe, Turkey, Argentina, etc. cetera. Um, but a lot of the countries uh, in which the, we're focusing the distribution of the COVAX vaccines out to don't have those systems in place today. And because of the nature of the pandemic, it's probably too late for them to put traceability systems in place to have any real effect on falsified uh, products and product divergence. So what type of model do we need? We worked together with a number of stakeholders to look at this, and we needed something that was fast to set up and also something that was very simple to deploy. 
something that allowed countries to define how they were going to operate with it. In particular, we have some countries uh, in Africa that have already started their journey towards traceability and are putting systems in place. So how do we dovetail those national um, initiatives in with uh, this central global um, trust repository? We've also got a requirement uh, for minimal infrastructure uh, locally. We need this to uh, be very easy to, to deploy. Just flicking through these, we also obviously want to act as a deterrent to criminals. Uh, we want criminals to know that we are protecting uh, the supply chain um, and preventing falsified products getting uh, to the patients. And it must leverage existing manufacturer serialization capability. So uh, as you know, manufacturers have already put in the capability to encode and serialize uh, using GS1 standards and 2D data matrix barcodes. Therefore, we've got to be able to re-leverage that because we don't have time uh, for manufacturers to do anything different uh, in order to feed us with their data. So when we looked at uh, all those requirements, uh, the answer was verification. So unlike uh, a track and trace model where you would be uh, following the product all the way through the supply chain, verification is very much simpler where you have the opportunity to scan a pack uh, and then to check that the unique identifiers, the, the, the serial numbers and GTINs on those packs are held within a, a database uh, and then you get a, a immediate response. Verification we know has been successful uh, and there was a pilot run uh, by uh, GSK uh, when I was working for them a few years ago and that, uh, that pilot actually identified falsified products uh, for uh, uh, antibiotics. So we know that verification can work in these types of environments. So let's move on. So the Global Trust Repository, um, we want to make it available to 92 countries. Um, we're focusing on the COVID-19 uh, vaccine packs. We're clearly trying to reduce the risk of falsified products. And as Ken said, we want to maintain trust uh, and confidence in the vaccines to prevent any hesitancy uh, or cause of concern. So this is a very simple schematic that breaks uh, the Global Trust Repository into four elements. I should stress these are not different things. This is all part of one system, uh, but just to make it easier to understand. Probably worth starting in the centre here, the Global Trust Repository, a big database. And what happens with that database is that the manufacturers, when they manufacture the vaccine products, uh, they will upload serial, unique serial numbers uh, and batch details into the Global Trust Repository. Once the goods have arrived in market and they're ready to be used, um, then it will be possible to use mobile uh, scanning devices, mobile phones, to scan the pack uh, and request a response uh, to see if that pack is indeed falsified or not. This is very, very much aimed at securing the legitimate supply chain, so verifying uh, the authorised products that are in the controlled supply chain. That's very much the focus. Now, that alone is interesting, but the real power of this system is at the top here with something that we have, we call a dashboard, and that's where the users of the system, uh, such as the manufacturers, um, the aid agencies, the governments themselves, will be able to see what's going on with those verifications, uh, both positive and negative, and also something that we call unusual activity or suspect activity. So, for instance, if you go on holiday, like I'm sure we'd all love to do, to the Seychelles, and you don't sell your bank, then um, if you use your credit card, you might get a message on your phone saying, is this you in the Seychelles? Is this really you? Um, that's unusual activity because uh, typically uh, you're not using your credit card in that country. In very much the same way, as well as being able to verify individual packs, we'll also be able to look for patterns uh, of packs that perhaps are being verified multiple times or in different countries, etc. And all of this information will be available via a dashboard uh, so that the manufacturers and the governments involved can look at that dashboard and start to assess whether they believe there might be uh, criminal activity going on. So that's where the, the, the real intelligence of this system uh, sits.
So just a little bit um, uh, for the people that are a bit more technically minded and interested in, in, in the standards, um, the minimum viable solution uh, will be based on the secondary pack. Um, that's uh, usually in, in COVID terms, that will be a tray or a carton of between maybe 10 up to about 100 vials. So it's not at the vial level, it's at the secondary pack level. We will be able to verify pallets or cases if, um, if the uh, serialized GTINs or the SSCC um, unique codes are given to us. So we can actually um, verify at um, a shipping case level if we, if we wanted. We'll be able to verify that uh, it is real product. And also we'll have some identification of if there's diversion uh, going on because we'll be able to see the same pack being scanned in multiple countries. What we've done as part of the COVAX tender uh, is we've our, we have a set of preferred characteristics and those preferred characteristics ask for serialization of the uh, packs using the GS1 standards. So any vaccine manufacturer that's supplying that tender that has the ability to serialize uh, will be able to participate in this work. We only need a smart device and an internet connection, um, so there's no uh, um, big integrations to uh, other IT systems. And in, in addition to providing verification, it will also start to give us what we call some points of light of where the products are and where they've reached, which could be quite interesting as we feed that back to the logistics folks. So as I've already uh, mentioned, this is all using GS1 standards. And um, for those that don't know, uh, the use of GS1 standards are already required by the end of this year uh, on all new tenders backed by Gavi and issued by UNICEF. Um, uh, and, and you can go online and find out more about that. And in addition, as I've already said, we have issued uh, a document here, uh, and there's the URL to that, uh, which is the preferred characteristics for the COVID vaccine tenders. And we believe that many of the, uh, many of the manufacturers, um, because they're global suppliers today, uh, or they're based in India, many of them already have the capability to serialize. Um, so they will be uh, voluntarily serializing and supplying us that data. Just uh, a last quick slide here, just to give you some idea of indicative timings. Right now, we are finalizing the technical requirements of that Global Trust Repository, uh, and UNICEF will be issuing a tender um, uh, shortly. So that's exactly where we are in the process. Um, we will then uh, deploy this out um, in sort of two Two, two ways. One is that we will partner with some countries uh, and do a comprehensive deployment. Uh, that uh, Treat them as, as sort of pilots. That will teach us the best way to get this tool out there and used. We will also have a self-surface capability um, so anybody could just immediately adopt the tool and start deploying it. And then we'll work with those countries to, to share the learnings from the early adopters um, as well. So very, very much uh, all going on live at the moment. That's really the end of my slides. I'll now have back to Hanno. Well, thank you, um, Ken and Grant. What a, what a fantastic initiative, and it will um, hopefully make a significant difference. So thank you very much. I think for the audience, um, please, as some of you have started to do, also uh, submit your questions um, uh, as, as part of the system. Um, we look forward to um, picking those out and discussing them. And indeed, as, as you saw, we are able to answer some them uh, immediately. Um, let's make this uh, a good dialogue. And then maybe uh, to get another uh, point of view around uh, how to make things happen, uh, let me ask uh, Peter O'Halloran from ACT Health in Australia to introduce himself um, and to share um, his experiences. Peter. Thank you, Thank you Hanno. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name's Peter O'Halloran from ACT Health. Um, I'm the Chief Information Officer here those of you who don't know an awful lot about us, um, you can read all the very exciting things about there about us later. Um, what I thought I'd do is just talk a bit about what we've been doing in the, in the response to COVID-19 here in the Australian Capital Territory. Um, I'm sure the, the ACT, as we're normally known, is something that's familiar to everybody who's on the call. But just in case it's not, I, I thought I'd point out a little bit about who we are and where we are. Uh, Australia obviously is very large, um, the ACT is not. Um, 
We, ha we have a tiny population. We are, in essence, a city-state. Uh, about 400,000 people in the ACT, another 200,000 or so in this immediate surrounding region. Um, and, of course, I'd love to say Australia is a lovely big island, and it is. Uh, coastlines of over 34,000 kilometres around Australia. The ACT is a small, landlocked, tiny part of Australia uh, surrounded by New South Wales, which is one of our larger states. Um, we're about 300 kilometres south of Sydney for those of you who are interested in geography. Um, and so I thought I'd preface a bit of what I'm talking about, um, talking about that. So we've been on the standards path uh, with GS1 and everyone else for quite a number of years now. And we really have integrated into what we do. So we are the public health system, uh, provide hospitals. Uh, we have three large or three main hospitals in the ACT. We have about 1,200 beds. Um, interestingly, I would point out that we have the second busiest hospital helipad in Australia, which makes little sense when you think we're a city state, except that we get patients from about half of New South Wales being flown into us because we're the major trauma centre for there. Um, back when cruise ships still existed, uh, we had people being flown off those from off the coast of Australia and coming to us. Uh, the, the What Australia pretends as ski fields came to us as well and a whole variety in between. Um, and we've been going down the path for a long time and it's provided a very good foundation for us actually starting to use the standards, whether it's sort of identifying who it is, whether it's a staff member, whether it's a patient, uh, different things such as specimen labels and the like but also locations and using the GLNs. Um, and I get excited by standards. I know that's a sad thing to say. Most people don't, but I think we'll come in a little while as to why it actually has made such a difference for us in our COVID-19 response. Um, we've been involved and I've been at ACT Health for about four years and nine years in the blood sector before that. And one of the things we've always been focusing on is starting to sort of get serialisation to focus on actually putting machine-readable um, barcodes on everything, whether that's people, um, ID cards, locations, products and the like, and actually starting to bring these standards in and to try and introduce them to our systems. So that's the foundation of where we've come from. And then, of course, last year hit us like everybody else. Uh, and we've done the full range of things like most people from uh, providing vaccinations, having testing clinics, whether that's sort of one there where people are driving through or sitting in rooms, all sorts of different things, and also focusing a lot on contact tracing. Australia, thankfully, um, we've been very, very fortunate with COVID-19 um, and the ACT even more so. We've had, the numbers here speak volumes. We've only had 124 cases. And so I can't really comprehend talking to colleagues overseas on a regular basis how they deal with 124 cases will be considered in most hospitals I talk to, that will be a slow day in a couple of wards. And so in the entire ACT since March last year, we've only had 124 cases and thankfully 121 people have recovered. Australia's had a very big focus around sort of contact tracing and test results. And so um, we've done over 200,000 test results um, and we've gone from turnaround times of about 48 hours for those now generally down to about six to nine hours and we're still doing the full um, spin them on the analyzers panthers and the like um, so we're not doing some of the rapid test results and we're actually using specimen labels collected all those test drive-through testing centers or the other ones using the gs1 sensor to actually get those straight onto the analyzer in the machine readable format and so that has actually sped up the time that it takes people to get a result and it's meant that we previously required everyone to actually quarantine as soon as they thought they might have a, a positive case until they had a negative result. Now it means rather than spending two or three days quarantined at home or in a hotel room, generally it's at most overnight. Um, vaccinations in Australia kicked off about 13 weeks ago. Uh, and in our government clinics here, we've already jabbed about 44,000 people in Canberra. If we presume that those are both doses, it's not quite, but let's assume it is, we, we've um, jabbed about 20, 22,000 people out of a population of 400,000. Not a particularly good answer yet, but we're at the process now scaling up and we expect in the next six, eight, 10 weeks to be tripling our throughput. And so we're actually getting to a point now where this is becoming routine for us. We're also, of course, unfortunately, unlike those in the Northern Hemisphere, starting to come into our flu season. And so we're now also juggling 
flu vaccinations at the same time as COVID vaccinations and really planning for how are we going to cope with this moving forward. Um, the other parts really, I think, and the challenges that this has provided in Australia, and once again, we've been very fortunate, is at a whole, it's the great unknown. When everything sort of happened March last year, we were all sitting there saying, will it be as bad as some of the other countries we've seen around the world, sort of in the early days of March? It really was an unknown factor for us. And so the extent of the issue, the challenges we would face, like everybody, we planned for the worst. We built temporary hospitals. We expanded our intensive care capacity. Uh, we did all of those type of things that everyone did. We planned for the beginning of the end for most of our health system to make sure that we were ready as patients came through the door. Thankfully, that didn't happen. We did, however, deal with the joys of a federated government structure. Like most countries, we have our own states and territories or regions or provinces in other countries, the equivalent. Um, and getting people to agree was a challenge. Workforce was a particular problem for us. Um, and, then, and the reason for that is a lot of the nursing staff in Australia actually come from overseas. And as COVID hit, a lot of people returned home, but also a lot of other staff couldn't come here. And so we've actually had the biggest challenge we're now facing is actually getting sufficient qualified nurses and doctors uh, to manage the vaccination sites and the testing, as well as normal healthcare services. Um, contact tracing, we went from in March, April, May, from a, a real problem where it was sort of people doing things on paper and pen. Uh, we had a big focus in Australia, and we'll touch on it in a moment, around trying Whilst we didn't pursue an official policy of eradication, in essence, that was the direction we were heading. Uh, and so it's a lot about getting people as they visit a business or a venue to check in and say that they're there. And we've worked a lot about with the contact traces on that. Vaccinations in Australia really came down to what we were saying to plan in about December last year and watching what's happening around the globe with sort of vaccine nationalism and so forth, that's impacted everyone. Thankfully for Australia, much less than some of the other countries. And we've actually been in a position where we're exporting uh, vaccines to some of our near neighbours, which is a wonderful thing to be in a position to do. But we really didn't actually have a plan for what our vaccination systems would be and how we would approach it nationally. Um, and of course, the final challenge is when we get to sort of nine months in the COVID world in Australia, complacency really has set in. We don't have many cases. We've had less than a thousand deaths, which is a thousand too many, but at the same time, compared to everyone else, an amazing number. Uh, and people have gone back to, it's back to normal life, ignore all these things. So we're delivering healthcare, delivering services and so forth. So that's been some of the challenges. And I touched on contact tracing. One of the really key things we've done is actually getting people to register and say, I've gone to this venue, whether that's going to the, you know, on a bus or a, a coffee shop or an office. We started off uh, having pieces of paper. It would take weeks for it to get to the contact traces, and we, in essence, found it was worthless. One of the things we did September last year or sort of October, September last year, had a bright idea and said, we can do this quickly and easily. Some countries have gone down sort of the Bluetooth triangulation path. Uh, a lot of the, the people in Australia really got very nervous about that, and so we've gone to a process whereby a simple app on a phone, you walk up to a venue, you scan a QR code, uh, and the data gets downloaded directly to our contact tracers who can use it if they need to. And in the ACT, once again, population of about 400,000, we've seen over 10,000 venues registered, 14 million check-ins, and nearly 700,000 times the app has been downloaded, which makes no sense except for maybe people have been breaking their phones, but we're also starting to get domestic tourism across Australia now, which is really exciting. Um, we released this. It was the first of its kind in Australia released. Um, there are eight states and territories in Australia. Um, and one of the things we really did when we developed this app is focus around how do we use the standards to make it work. And so for each of those 10,000 plus sites that we've registered, we've allocated a global location number or a GLN to them. And so it really does mean that we're doing that and we're working with GS1 so that we can actually share that data with other jurisdictions and we can use it uh, to do contact tracing. And that was the basis of how we do everything. We don't think about doing projects without using standards. It just seems an anathema to us. We can't comprehend why you would do something without doing it in a standards-based way. That then actually turned into something quite different for us that we didn't expect, um, was that 
three of the other states and territories in Australia actually approached us and said, we like your app, can you give it to us? Uh, and so we've actually uh, exported it, shall we say, and provided on a, a very minimal cost recovery basis, which I think means I'm losing money, but at the same time, we're actually opening up the country. Um, and we're now providing it, for those of you who know Australia, sort of the Northern Territory and Queensland and Tasmania. So half the states and territories in Australia are now using the system. And the beauty of why it actually mattered about using global location numbers is that we've been able to design in such a way that it's interoperable. If I take check in CBR, CBR for Canberra, and I go to the Northern Territory or Tasmania or Queensland, I can check in at any of their sites using my app. So I use the app from Canberra because I'm from Canberra. I go there, I scan. Because we've used GLNs, we have a central register. The system knows actually that's a code from XYZ and the data is sent directly to the contact tracers in that jurisdiction. And it sounds simple and it is simple and it's easy. But it's also something that we've been able to do because we did actually do it on the basis of standards. And this is something that we're now starting to use across Australia to really open up the country. Um, I'll get off this in a moment. I know contact tracing is not the most exciting thing for everyone, but I'll tell you what, it is an essential one. Um, whilst I'm a Chief Information Officer, um, I can't get excited by computers and things. Machines that go ping are fundamentally boring. What I get excited about is outcomes. How does this make, open up the country? How does this actually improve patient outcomes? How does this let us get on top of an outbreak quicker? And so we actually built a whole team that involved everyone from our chief health officer and those running the pandemic response through to our communications team and technical people and even people who would literally prepare packs for venues and send them out. We even got as far as actually decorating the side of a tram um, with big ads actually saying, don't forget to download your app and promote it. Uh, and these are the type of things that we've done. It's all about how do we engage with the community? How do we actually get their trust? And building that trust has been essential for what we've done subsequently. So we then fast forward a few months and we come to vaccinations. And I think probably about two days after Christmas, I get a call from um, the head of our health department here in the ACT saying, congratulations, I hope you had a lovely Christmas. Um, I'll see you in the office in three hours. Um, and we get the notice that vaccines are arriving in February. It's all hands on deck, we're now saying, to get there. And the challenge we'd had is we have a very old variety, a huge variety of very old ICT systems. And I operate a huge amount of ICT systems that don't like to talk together, don't work in a consolidated manner, and are quite frankly embarrassing. We were, however, in the process of about to implement a new electronic medical record system um, from a company called Epic, some of you might have heard of, to actually transform our healthcare system. I get a phone call from Epic saying, we'd like to try and work with you and help, what can we do? And we went from the idea of actually going, we were originally going to do all this on paper, um, going from the idea of doing it on paper to actually doing it in a system in 15 days. And so we implemented the entire system for vaccines from start to finish in 15 days, including using video conferencing with people in lockdown, uh, from quarantining uh, overseas to our first vaccination uh, in the ACT there with our Australian Government Health Minister and the local ACT one. That's, we think, very exciting. And we also thought it would be very simple in some ways. We finally got hold of the products and we knew once we actually started getting the products, they actually had GS1 barcodes on them. It sounds silly, but until we finally received them, we didn't actually know that that's what we were going to get. Likewise, the supply chain in those early days was very fragmented. Uh, and so we would get vaccines and often advice a day before it arrived that the vaccine was coming. We'd rather have vaccines and be able to vaccinate people or not. So we're always very happy to get the call, but it was a real challenge. And so actually we then finally worked out we had vaccines with barcodes we could use and we're going, wonderful, we can provide the traceability, we've implemented a system in 15 days that reads the barcodes, we've got all the devices, smart clinical grade smartphones that will read the barcode, upload it, do all the patient safety checks, this is amazing. We then of course discover that our pharmacy inventory management system doesn't quite deal with barcodes and it's the predominant one used across Australia in hospitals. And so that was a real challenge that we're still dealing with 13 weeks later. Modern systems might work, 
and I can get the product with the right barcode, I can get a new EMR that will do it, I can put in all the hardware to read it, I can train the staff, but there's always one legacy system that trips you up. Uh, and this is from a vendor who wants to make it work, and so it, it's a real challenge that we're coming to. Likewise, we're also facing huge issues at the moment as Australia moves to um, uploading all these details to the Australian Immunisation Register, which in essence is a national database that actually provides the detail for everybody who's been vaccinated and will soon be used to produce a sort of vaccine passport. Um, in Australia, we hope we're actually allowed to travel overseas in the coming months. It's sort of, we, we've dealt with COVID-19 by closing our borders, isolating away and hoping the world goes away and leaves us alone. Um, as all of us can imagine, that's not really viable and not something that anyone wants. And so now we're focused on, we've done the patient identification, now do we actually produce the vaccine passport and make it go out? So that really, I suppose, in a nutshell, gives you an idea of some of the challenges we've faced. Um, and the barcodes and the standards have been, it sounds strange to say, but it's been perfect. It was part of how we actually dealt with this. And so if we look at where we've come from in this, what has been our success? One, we had a workforce that was capable and could actually do this. Secondly, we had the infrastructure, and whether that's physical ICT infrastructure, wires in walls, machines that go ping, all that type of thing. But it was also very much the infrastructure around we had that base foundation of the standards for identifying people, identifying locations, identifying products. And that has been key for us because we've been able to ensure multiple patient safety issues have not occurred because we've been able to use those codes when we're injecting people to make sure it's the right product going to the right patient. And finally, the last ingredient I think that worked for us was innovation. Um, and if I, I sort of quote Disraeli there, we prepared for the worst, hoped for the best, and to date we've been very fortunate. So Hanno, over to you and thank you. Well, Peter, thank you so much for a fantastic presentation and uh, making uh, what is sometimes a little bit esoteric and, uh, and not very real, very livable and visceral. So thank you very much, Peter. Um, what we'd like to do now is uh, open for the last 15 minutes um, for questions. Uh, and we've already had uh, some questions. And, and let me maybe turn uh, firstly to, um, to Ken and Grant around the, some of the questions that came out already, which are predominantly related to um, how the data even gets into um, the GTR system. Um, and in, in particular, given the change of many manufacturers uh, not delivering to wholesalers anymore, but delivering almost directly to vaccination centers? Does that change the cost-benefit equation, if you like, of the GTR, of the uh, Global uh, Trust Repository? And then how does the data get into the system? Whose responsibility is it? Is it the, the manufacturing site? Is it the, the marketing act, uh, authorization holder? Um, or is it the, even the local distributor where that exists? Sure, Ken, would you like me to start with uh, the technical side of that? So um, quite simply with uh, most traceability systems, the, the serialization and batch data will come from the manufacturer. Um, so uh, we're no different there. When the products are manufactured, once the batch is released, then we would ask for the data to be uploaded directly into our system. Uh, so now if there are some repackers or something of that nature before the goods uh, are shipped, then obviously it can come from those repackers, um, but fundamentally under the governance of the market authorization holder. So that's no different to any other traceability system. And, and the way that we intend to work there is to reuse the type of interfaces that uh, are already in place between manufacturers and traceability systems. Um, so this is going to be very, very similar to the way that uh, manufacturers will link to the EU FMD system or uh, the, the, the Turkish track and trace system, etc. So that, that, that's the method. Um, and because it's not track and trace, uh, that just needs to be uploaded in time for the goods uh, once they're dispatched and then will arrive in market. So we have a longer lead time there. Um, so it's basically the data has to get up there before the goods are, are, are in transit effectively. Fantastic. Anything to add, Ken? No, thank you. Fantastic. Good. And I think um, 
uh, what that also suggests is that because we can verify the data, I think uh, my question again from a system design, I'd be interested to uh, on Peter's view on this is second, is how could you actually use the verification almost as a way of checking vaccines progress, creating another data point about what has been done? Um, and who do you expect in the end to actually use the verification um, database um, to ensure the vaccines are safe? Grant, or Ken, maybe to start with? Yes, of course. So fundamentally, this is a system for verification. It's not a <clears throat> logistics management system or, or a traceability system. Um, Every, every scan that we do will allow the user to verify the pack, but more importantly, that will create a database of transactions. Uh, and as I hinted at earlier, it's through that database that then you can start to pick up unusual activity. Um, so the same pack being continuously scanned or the same pack appearing in multiple locations. So that's really the purpose of our dashboard. Now, having said that though, um, that will hold interesting data that might allow, as we said, points of light into the supply chain. So if you know that a particular batch has been scanned within um, uh, within a country, then you would at least know that that batch has made it into the supply chain of that country. But we don't have a concept of locations with regards to sort of GLNs within our system. So um, we might, uh, we'll have geolocations from the phone, so we know physically where that good is, but we're not trying to say it's in this warehouse or it's in, in that hospital. So we're not down to that level. Um, it's purely just to say the geolocation type information is just to say which country it is in. And you might be able to get down to territory. Um, so some points of light that could be in, uh, interesting as sort of secondary supporting data to other logistics processes and things like that. Obviously, in future, that might well change if, if this GTR becomes more of a traceability system, working with national traceability systems, then, then gradually we, we move to a world of more visibility. But currently, um, we, we stop our traceability at that sort of country level. Yeah, that's very, very helpful. Um, and I, I mean, you know, that links me into Peter's, uh, some of your reflections in terms of how do you then think uh, the, the, the role of standards has actually enabled you to scale much more effectively. Uh, you alluded to it on a number of different um, factors and, uh, you know, you talked about the GS1 standards for, for backouts. I'm just interested, how does that impact um, your operation and to what extent does that make it easier or harder? Look, I think it, it, where we've been using the standards, we found that, for example, turning mm -hmm. around the, the turnaround time for pathology test results we had the standards, we had the infrastructure. Very quickly, almost within two weeks, we could reduce that turnaround time dramatically. And so it just gives you the ability to do things much more efficiently, much faster. And then as we discovered with the contact tracing, to actually share that data and do it in a way that's interoperable. And so I really look at the work that sort of Ken and Grant are doing and say, it would be ideal if we could then start when we're starting to scan the products and capturing the details and where it is serialized that we'd actually have that inventory control to know where a product is, particularly if we're all focused as we are on reducing any unnecessary wastage so that we really can ensure that every jab occurs. But it's also about how do we actually build up that, that picture so that people are very clear, this product actually is valid to be used, it is safe and is not falsified, but also that actually it has been used somewhere already and already recorded as being used. And so I see that's the type of thing where the standards really come into their own and as we build our local and our national systems based on that standard, it then becomes very easy to then plug into other international initiatives rather than having to build it all from scratch every time. So that, that ability to scale globally and to do things we hadn't conceived when we first started, I think is the true power behind this. Excellent. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, and it's, I mean, both of you have alluded, or all three of you have alluded to this theme that actually we are laying the foundation for something that is, uh, points us into a different direction for the future and builds a capability for the future. Um, and maybe Ken in particular, you mentioned that um, the GTR may go beyond clearly vaccines now. Could you say a little bit more about what the, the potential of this infrastructure is that you're building now? Yeah, I mean, thanks for that question. And I think um, 
the trace, as I had indicated in the presentation, people have been working on traceability, track and trace before COVID. Um, and there's been great interest in trying to support governments to develop their own traceability systems and accompanying legislation, which GS1 has been engaged in. Um, UNICEF in particular, procuring such large quantities of donor subsidized vaccines for children, um, sees the potential of the Global Trust Repository as having uh, won the verification potential beyond COVID vaccines, because we do know that other vaccines are falsified. Um, we have those documentations in the World Health Organization. Um, and then secondly, um, to be able to, um, um, when national traceability systems come online, and we have had some progress in Nigeria, Ethiopia, Rwanda, Egypt, um, Iran, and some other countries, when those traceability systems come online and they are still receiving uh, product, uh, we're able to uh, act as an intermediary to pass that data on. And I think um, finally, which I also mentioned was, um, which was similar to the European Union, um, rather than setting up 27 different regulatory markets, uh, the Global Trust Repository allows us to helpfully standardize and bring some standardization into um, products being delivered to low or middle income countries, which right now have immature legislation and policies and systems. And so we can act as a catalyst for the standardization across regulatory markets and hopefully um, one, help to verify, but two, to enable these traceability systems of the future. Over. I mean, that's very interesting. And maybe, maybe attach one more technical question which came out of um, uh, the the, the questions asked by the audience is uh, clearly the GTR is not just usable for aid agencies or for developing countries. It is a universal system, and so that even a a donor, you know, if Papua New Guinea, for example, receives a donation from Australia for vaccines, they should be able to use that system as well. Is that correct? Well, initially, we are focused, as I think people will know, technically online view the number of of, of uh, terms of usage which you have with manufacturers, um, the number of regulatory markets you interact with, the number of products that are in the system all impact the operation of that system. And so there is the potential because we are building the system as Grant indicated earlier on EPCIS traceability. So it could be used for multiple products, both donor subsidized and not in the future. That will be up to the governance structure and those that are working to fund this, including, and I forgot to mention the governments of Nigeria and Rwanda are on there, um, and making sure that um, any additional manufacturers, products, whether donor subsidized or not, is agreed to by countries and by manufacturers and all interested parties that are funding this. So yes, there is a lot of potential. And secondly, the decision makers around that are the key stakeholders in that, from manufacturers to per procurement agencies to recipient governments. Over. Fantastic. Yeah, and if I can just come in on that as well, um, we're not trying to be a single traceability system for the whole world. That's that's not our objective. We start with. Um, very narrowly wanting to be able to provide a verification capability for COVID. Yes, that could be expanded to other products because, of course, the system doesn't care as long as it's coded and you've got the data, it, it will work um, and, and we'll build it on infrastructure that is scalable. So we will have the opportunity to scale this to other products. I think that there will come a point where countries uh, will want to implement national traceability legislation and establish systems uh, within their, their, their territory um, to manage local products. And at that point, we then become more of a feeder system to those local national systems. Um, so there will be an evolution here. And I guess over time, we're going to have very much a mixed model. You're going to have some countries that have traceability systems in place, others that don't. Uh, and, the, and the system will be able to dovetail into those different countries according uh, to what's most appropriate. Thank you very much.
Grant. And maybe, uh, Peter, a, a similar question to you in terms of the infrastructure that you've built and the lessons that you've learned. Um, I mean, how how will you expect the, to use this in the future? Uh, and what can health systems do now to prepare for uh, the unknown future uh, pandemic, the unknown next crisis um, that will undoubtedly hit us at some point in the future? Look, I think really it's about getting those foundations that we've all discussed in place now. Mm -hmm. We didn't plan like everyone for COVID or we had a few other natural disasters before that. But by actually having that capability where everything we did and everything we planned for the future was based around being flexible, having the infrastructure, whether that's people or standards or systems and hardware, has what set us in good stead. And so we have the ability to pivot very quickly and change to what we need to do. And I would love to say that I'm a genius who could have predicted everything that would happen and how all of that would work together to give us a great outcome. The reality is it was just we were very lucky that we'd, we'd planned and done all these things well so that we could pivot and react quickly. And I think that's, that's the one take home I would really message for everyone I would emphasise is doing your normal business as usual work in a good manner and planning well and structuring it and putting those infrastructure pieces in place and using standards sets you up very well for whatever's coming next that we can't possibly imagine and I don't think really want to think about right now. Fantastic, Peter. Well, I mean, what a uh, fascinating uh, lunchtime evening slash morning session uh, for ever you, wherever you are in, in the world. Um, I think we've explored a number of different solutions to really build trust um, in vaccines, uh, in particular through the Global Trust Repository, um, and using standards to, to actually ex expedite that in a way that prevents uh, the falsification, making sure the right uh, rate vaccines get to the right people um, at the right time. Um, and we also hope that this show of force in building trust in this entire supply chain is actually something that will reduce vaccines hesitancy and actually make people confident that vaccinating us all is the right thing. And we've heard from Peter just what a monumental effort it is um, to actually make this happen on the ground, um, even in a, a sophisticated a healthcare system um, as ACT and Australia in general. Um, and how, in both cases, we've we've heard how the role of standards actually make things easier um, and create a, a leg up in terms of making the, the changes necessary and in particular, increasing the communication between what has become a tremendous global ecosystem of different companies, um, ch uh, aid agencies, governments, uh, manufacturers um, and organizations like UNICEF. So all this uh, leads me to simply say thank you um, uh, on behalf of Deloitte from UNICEF, um, as well as ACT and Ken Grant and Peter in particular, uh, and to GS1 for hosting us um, today. And I hope the audience found it interesting and useful. Uh, and let me hand over back to Geraldine to close. Thank you. And thank you very much, Hanno, Ken, Grant, Peter. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Please continue the dialogue. Join us as well for the third edition of the GS1 Healthcare Online Summit in November. No one will be safe until everyone is safe. And we need a global response for this pandemic to end. We also need trust to build up the future. Please stay well and thank you.